Welcome, Boyd. Thanks. I'm just wondering, with the line of work that you've, you're in currently and have been in for a long time, I'm just wondering, is there, a, is there a vignette or a moment in your life that inspired you to choose this path? Uh, well, I was, I, was, I was actually originally a, a, a straight-up doctor, basically, dealing with diabetes, and I got into prevention. And then I, did some, I was doing some metabolic research in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, with the Pima Indians, who have an enormous uh, rate of diabetes. And um, we were spending all of our time examining inside the body, looking for the causes of obesity um, and, and diabetes and all the different enzymes and metabolic pathways. But one drive down to the reservation to see all of the signs and symptoms of a marginalised population, you could just see that the problem was actually external to the individual. And I thought, what a waste of space spending my time looking inside the body. The answers are outside. No, that's, that, that's a great glimpse. Imagine I'm a clairvoyant, Boyd, and I can see the future and give answers to your questions and concerns, OK? If you had one question for me about the future evolution of community-based obesity prevention, what would one question be to me, this clairvoyant who can gaze into his crystal ball and see the future? OK, I want to know when the tipping point is going to occur such that this stuff that we're all talking about here now becomes kind of normalised and gathers its own momentum based on its own success and so on. At the moment, we are pushing very, very hard against a whole lot of um, problems within the community and the politics and the funding and things. There's going to be some point, and a little bit like um, tobacco or road injuries or those sorts of things, where, yep, it's kind of accepted and this is what you do and one thing leads on to another and it becomes an easier, an easier task, <laughs> because at the moment I, there were quite a few words going up and down on that one, you know, when you had to put in one word, uh, there was a lot of frustrated and uh, difficult and complex and tough. Um, there's going to become a day, I think, when we've got enough history behind us and, there's, and enough people get it, there's enough momentum and culture change that actually we'll see a whole lot of different one words up there. What, what in the current what in the current context, this current time, is making that tipping point hard? What for you is, if I was to ask you the question, what it is that most needs our attention to move us closer to that tipping point, what would be one of those things? Well, I think it's, uh, you, you see it in a few places. We've seen it in Victoria, we see it in New York. You see it where the leaders get it and put their weight behind it and are prepared to stick their neck out and go for it in this, in this early stage. You know, in X years' time, um, like, like with tobacco, it won't be that difficult to do, to, to do the catch-up and to do the leapfrog because there have been so many pioneers before. But at the moment, it's political pioneer territory. And um, that's, that's why it's difficult, because po uh, politicians are innately risk-averse, um, but they are so critical that we've got to get them to take risks. So this is, to me, the, the challenge. But it'll, it'll, it'll change, and we'll do this kind of... A little bit like Australia did with tobacco with um, states, just one leapfrogging over the next and, you know, making the change and catch up and doing it a bit better. So when HTV comes to New Zealand, we'll do it better than Victoria. <laughs> so let's take that question of what needs attention from, from Boyd's response to your response, and we're going to move over to the table now. So we're going to take you through what we've learned from that last process before lunch. So, Boyd, what, what, what's one thing that really stood out to you? Whew. Well, actually, the biggest, the biggest uh, response by far from e everybody started with the letters P-O-L, um, whether it was policy or politics or politicians. Um, so that's by far the biggest kind of hunk, because those are the real world um, challenges we face right now. But I wonder if I might just kind of move up towards that through some of, the, some of these other ones because I think they are, they are very important perspectives as well. So there were quite a bunch around um, uh, culture shift and, and community attitudes and that sort of thing. Um, and some of them were a little bit like um, the safety for people in streets, uh, things like our values around food and eating. But there was also a bit in this attitudes around getting a social revolution. Um, anger and action 
kind of trying to create um, a movement, if you like, yeah. you know, bottom-up grassroots approach, uh, that, that kind of thing. So I think the social and, and cultural values um, are, are pretty critical, not only in getting stuff moving, having that political pressure, um, but also in, in the end having things that are healthy and being normal. Um, so I think that that is important, and actually uh, another one of my dreams is that everyone in this room and all these mayors that are committed now use your force and your, your ability not only to shift your community, but to look upwards and shift the state and the federal um, space. Because at the moment, um, you know, there's a lot more that can be done at a, at, a, at a policy level, which we'll kind of come to. But if there's, if there's sufficient grassroots action, including your leaders and the mayors, getting them to um, face upwards and say, hey, you want us to do this? Okay, you do this. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty important. Um, there are a bunch of things around whole systems approaches, around ownership, um, around getting it to other um, organisations, wider responsibility, accountability came up. So this idea that multiple different sectors have different responsibilities and accountabilities, um, coordination and systems. So I think, I think again, that's, that's a little bit like we would like to see what this product is going to look like at the end in a totality, that, uh, that, that different players are playing their role and they are accountable to each other. So within that, a little bit of a subsystem of of that were around the diversity of players was around the private sector, the role of the private sector, um, businesses and industry, um, engaging the big vendors, uh, supporting them to make changes, that sort of thing. And that is, uh, that is a tricky one. I think it's, uh, as Jean-Michel pointed out, it's probably much easier to do at a local level, but to try and do that at a national level does require a bit of this kind of cultural push and cultural change. So. Um, at the moment, the role of big food and big soda and things is, is quite difficult. It's a, big, it's a big challenge, and we have to find a way uh, for them. But they have to be accountable for their actions, um, and some of these things mentioned up here in policies will, will, will help to sort of say, OK, here is the, here's the policy constraints within which you operate. You, know, you deliver us food systems, um, but these are the constraints, and... Uh, Things like marketing to kids and things um, needs to be uh, needs to be taken. Uh, they they shouldn't be doing that. So that's they, they need they, those policies need to be in place. Um, the biggest single pile, of course, was for funding and sustainability of funding. Um, su sustainable across uh, multiple levels, uh, more than health contributing in. Um, getting local governments, getting it embedded within local governments, so embedding is important in here. Um, future funding, non-government, question around food industry. So obviously you've got big questions around the sustainability of funding in this, and I'm not sure that there's any really magic answers for this, other than the types of things that you're doing to make sure that they are in, in plans. Um, I do think that in the end what what, what is convincing is, um, is, is evidence, is evidence that you can't afford not to do this. And some of the types of evidence, um, I think, are more strategic than others. So evidence about what is happening in this council compared to what is happening in this council. What does this food system look like compared to this food system? Really local evidence. Um, I think really carries carries There's weight. A few questions on that, so the presenters too around evidence and evaluation. That was a pretty compelling theme in questions. Yeah. So, um, uh, so I mean, and, and this this kind of speaks to a little bit of the stuff that we're doing at the moment to try to get measures of food environments and policy change, and be able to compare different jurisdictions, different states, different local governments, different national governments, um, because that kind of local evidence in that kind of benchmarking way, actually cuts right through to, to the CEO. So, um, so you know, the, the answer to resourcing, it's not, it's not simple, but I think that kind of stuff drives it. Then we're back to the three Ps. Then we're back up to all the Ps. Um, so there's, uh, there were a bunch of them, in fact, uh, you know, similar, similar size pile around uh, converting theory um, into policy and into action. 
uh, regulation in the, um, of the food industry, access to affordable healthy food, taxing unhealthy food, um, planning provisions to make for healthier environments, giving the local governments the ability to um, decide on, the, on, on food availability and food, food stores, strengthening um, apolitical approaches, uh, and so on. So there's quite a lot in the policy, government buy-in and embed the policy, uh, moving from programs to built-in policy and systems. So I think people here clearly get the value of, of policy in a policy in a kind of rule-making sense, you know, whether it's, whether it's like legal rules like regulations or policies and guidelines and things. Now, I do have a couple more questions for you, so we'll uh, okay. move through these last Political couple. will, um, political will you've, um, you've heard about quite a lot, and uh, I think the approach that EPOD is taking of having that, and, and also an HTV, of making that a, a really important pillar um, is tremendous, and, uh, and I have to say on reflection, all the work, uh, the early work that we did in the bar in South West, when we went back and analysed what had changed in community capacity and so on, the area that we probably did the least well in was, uh, was in supporting political change. So um, there's a lot in that and supporting the minister, supporting your own mayors. Um, there are a few also on monitoring and evaluation and as that came up this morning a lot, how can you know that this program works, that kind of stuff and in particular childhood BMI is going to be the crunch I think. If you can show it's going down here um, you know, in Victoria compared to other places then that's, that'll be the crunch. Terrific, lovely summation. Now with all of that in mind, and that's, that's a huge terrain just there, you're now the clairvoyant and you can see the future. Things have turned out well according to your best scenarios. Can you paint a picture of a good scenario for the future, however far out you wish to take it for us, just for a few minutes? What would a successful future look like for you with all of that in mind? Um, it's a little bit like the question that, you, <laughs> that I put to you about the tipping point. Um, you know, I think it's like we, we saw just a couple of weeks ago Mexico getting, getting through taxes on junk food and, and sugar-sweetened beverages. You know, that's the, big, the first big country with a major problem is sugar-sweetened beverages in other places, but that was a huge political battle, and that represents a new stake in the ground. And if we get sufficient countries doing that, it'll seem uh, low risk enough for politicians to make, those, to make those steps. And I hope that we're going to get an acceleration of that kind of thing. Just like I'll bet you that all of the stuff that people here are doing in Healthy Together communities is already spilling out into the other communities. They know what's happening, they're starting to talk to their... I mean, there's a lot of the questions that came up before, how do other communities get involved and so on. Um, I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, what's going to happen. Last question. Thinking ahead and imagining the next few years, particularly with this group of people in mind. So let's, the context is this group of practitioners and policy makers and professionals. What are the big decisions that this field, this sector, are going to need to make in the next few years? What for you are the main forks in the road that will make the biggest difference for us changing the game in the future? Uh, well, each election is a fork. Um, so, <laughs> fork in elections. <laughs> um, Don't tweet that some, anyone. Some people got that. <laughs> so, uh, and I think the political challenge uh, and the people within the department know this. I mean, in Victoria, they were heading for a Labor government, talked with them for a long time, and then bang, they've got a, they've got a new flavour government. And, you know... Extremely fortunately, this minister got it and has taken it up. But each each election is a is a challenge. So this is a political challenge, no question about that. There's, there is going to be a big challenge when this uh, funding, this this partnership funding, comes to an end. You know, it's okay while the money's flowing, but how do you get this kind of embedded? And we um, we had a very useful lesson come out to us from uh, evaluation of our community-based approaches in the Bar and South West, where the first funding, you know, went into Colac in a kind of a, a project sense, and uh, the rest of the Barwon region was the comparison area. And at the end of those three years of intervention, um, Colac had done better than the rest of the, of the region. But we, when we went back another three years later, we found that 
there had been a bit of a post-project slump in Colac. In other words, when you get a dose of money that comes as a start and a finish, you get this kind of slump because it's not embedded. And so they, they did drop down in their resources. The rest of the Bow and Southwest region had kind of heard through the grapevine, picked themselves up, got whatever programs were going around, reoriented their own funding, worked out how to do it. They were now doing actually much more and probably in a more sustainable way because it had been built up from the grassroots. And that's why I think the systems approach is a real advantage because you've got your eyes focused. Even though the money that's coming in feels like to local government it's a project, you know, the way that you're dealing with it and delivering it is a true systems-based approach. So I think that does hold hope for me. Boyd, thank you so much.